My name is Rose George. I'm an author and journalist, and I'm delighted to have been asked to uh, give you one of the Darwin lectures this year, 2021, uh, on the theme of blood. I've written journalism over the years for many different publications, including The Guardian, The New York Times, The New Statesman, on many different topics, including uh, a visit to Saddam Hussein's birthday party twice. Um, I've also been a war correspondent in Kosovo for one day for Condé Nast Traveller magazine. And I've also written four books. My first was about refugees in Liberia. My second was about toilets and sanitation. Uh, my third, I ran away to sea on a container ship and I wrote about the rather ignored world of modern shipping that still, despite what people think, still brings us 90% of everything we consume. And my fourth book is Nine Pints, a journey through the mysterious magical world of blood. And I'm going to draw on that to talk to you about the villains and heroes of blood. Welcome to our sixth talk in the 2021 Darwin College Lecture Series on Blood. This week, we hear from the author and journalist Rose George. For her most recent book, Nine Pints, Rose travelled widely to understand the place of blood in our world. In it, she shares many fascinating and curious stories, some of which I'm sure we'll hear later on, so I don't want to preempt her. Her book explores interesting questions about blood, such as why are leeches still found in hospital pharmacies? Why are thousands of people still seeking justice after they were given contaminated blood in the 1980s? And why do Silicon Valley millionaires think injecting young blood into their bodies will give them eternal youth? Interestingly, Rose's work hasn't gone unnoticed by the super wealthy. In reviewing Nine Pints, Bill Gates wrote, if you get grossed out by blood, this one probably isn't for you. But if you're like me and find it fascinating, you'll enjoy this book by a British journalist with an especially personal connection to the subject. I'm a big fan of books that go deep on one specific topic. So Nine Pints was right up my alley. It's filled with super interesting facts that will leave you with a new appreciation for blood. So tonight, it's my real pleasure to introduce Rose George and her lecture entitled Blood Villains and Heroes. Blood is an extraordinarily rich subject, but also substance. And throughout history, we have struggled to understand it. And often, we give it a duality that I find intriguing. We know that it can kill us. We know that it can give us life. We know that it can be seen as polluting, but in the form of a blood bag of a transfusion, it's also seen as something extremely positive. And throughout literature, we can see this idea, um, particularly in the figure of Medusa, who exemplified this dual nature of blood um, because on, the veins on her left side contained blood that was lethal and the right side gave life. And I'm going to jump from Medusa to Frank Capra, who did a film in the 1930s called Hemo the Magnificent, an educational film about blood. And his main character was Hemo the Magnificent, who was a cartoon superhero uh, who exemplified blood. So he was also kind of Robin Hood blood. And um, I'm quite fond of Hemo, and I think it's a wonderful film. It's all it's very educational. But one thing that Hemo says early on to his two fellow protagonists, two humans, he says, humans think blood means disease, wounds, pain. These friends, and he gestures to the animals, they know me for what I really am, health, life. I'm the song of the lark the blush on the cheek, the spring of the lamb. I am the precious sacrifice ancient man offered up to his gods. I am the sacred wine in the silver chalice. Down through the ages, I am the price men pay for freedom. But to you scientists, I am a smear on a slide, a stain, a specimen, a sickness. <laughs> 
My story is a song only poets should sing, not disease lovers. And I mention Hemo and Medusa because I think obviously villains and heroes are also a dual prospect. And throughout my several years of research and traveling around the world, I found plenty of heroes. That wasn't difficult, but uh, villains was a little trickier. But let me start anyway by introducing you to my first villain. And you would think this man to be a villain, particularly if you were an English transfusionist in the mid-17th century, or a dog, or a lamb, or a cow. Because my first villain is a man named Jean-Baptiste Denis, who was the personal physician of Louis XIV of France and who is judged to have uh, performed the first successful transfusion of blood into a human being. Throughout history, what people generally did with blood in a medical context was remove it from bodies. So bloodletting was a standard procedure for pretty much any ailment, including blood loss. And in fact, throughout history, there have been several casualties of bloodletting, including George Washington, um, and Lord Byron, who uh, on his deathbed derided the damned set of butchers who wanted to leech him a bit further, but died anyway. But um, since William Harvey earlier on in the century had discovered blood circulation, even though Harvey's research was not particularly prized during Harvey's lifetime, it did set the stage for other medical men to um, wonder if removing blood um, could uh, kill you. So when you generally see people losing blood, apart from in a bloodletting situation, um, losing excess blood generally led to death. So what if you could introduce blood? It would surely give life. And they began to experiment with the easiest subjects they could, they could find, which were animals. And there are plenty of etchings and engravings of poor creatures looking quite annoyed, in my view, um, spread eagled and splayed and being bled um, for the purposes of uh, advancing medical science. And animals were also used because it was thought that if you were introducing a foreign blood into the body, you were also introducing spirit. And so... Animals were generally chosen who were thought to have an amiable spirit, so dogs, or the mild and laudable blood of a lamb, or a placid cow or calf. So by the late uh, 17th century, uh, transfusion had become a race. Uh, there were sets of men in London and Paris who were both vying to successfully transfuse blood into a human being. But Jean-Baptiste got there first, um, and on the 15th of June 1667, he uh, transfused blood into a youth of 15 who had been tormented with fever for several months, who had had his blood let by physicians 20 times over that time to assuage his excessive heat. So on, on June the 15th, he was bled uh, to the extent of three ounces, and in exchange, he was given nine ounces from the carotid artery of a lamb. Apparently, the change was then startling, and presently the boy was showing a clear and smiling countenance, where previously he had passed the time in incredible stupidity. However, he had felt a very great heat along his arm, which we know now is the clear sign of an incompatible blood transfusion and is hemolytic shock. But his was not too serious and he survived. Denis carried on experimenting on various children and uh, people he paid and his most famous case was his final one where he transfused Antoine Mauroy who was a madman, a wife beater and a former valet to nobility. To calm Mauroy's frenzy uh, Denis decided to use the blood of a calf and at first, Denis was, um, Mohua, sorry, was very lucky because he didn't react too adversely. For the second transfusion, he was given more blood, 
and Denis described without knowing it hemolytic shock. Because as soon as Morois um, began to receive the blood, he felt the heat along his arm, his pulse rose, and he started sweating. He then vomited up bacon and fat, uh, but the next morning woke calm. And then he made a great glass of urine of a colour as black as if it had been mixed with the blood of chimneys. Of course, it wasn't soot, but uh, his dead blood cells killed by the foreign blood. Moa did survive, briefly, but uh, then he died. His wife was probably executed for his murder, and Denis was disgraced. But in London, these experiments continued. And Richard Lower, who was Denis's great rival, um, picked for his most famous case, he also picked a madman, Arthur Coger, whose brother was master of Pembroke College. Arthur Coger was given 20 shillings for his trouble, and he was given 12 ounces of sheep's blood in just over a minute. Koga survived, but the disgrace of Denis's experiments was too great, and there were too many mishaps um, in these experiments, and event transfusion fell out of favour in uh, the UK and was outright banned in France. And one of the worries was that um, if you were being given the spirit of an animal, then perhaps you would become that animal. And as the surgeon Geoffrey Langdon Keynes described, uh, there were fears that terrible results such as the growth of horns would follow the transfusion of an animal's blood into a human being. And the playwright Thomas Shadwell, in his restoration satire, The Virtuoso, skewers the practice of transfusion as quackery and has his transfusionist character, Sir Nicholas Gimcrack, report on his patient. From being maniacal or raging mad, he became wholly ovine or sheepish. He bleated perpetually and chewed the cud. He had wool growing on him in great quantities, and a Northamptonshire sheep's tail did soon emerge or arise from his anus or humane fundament. Transfusion did survive. It, there was a renaissance in the early 19th century. Um, another royal physician, James Blundell, who was obstetrician to Queen Victoria, amongst other things, got heartily sick of watching his female patients die in childbirth of blood loss. And he experimented, but he used he used human blood because he thought uh, quite reasonably that in an emergency, how would you get a cow upstairs? And he had a decent enough success rate. He uh, Some of his patients died. Some were already dead and didn't revive. And eventually transfusion became the standard medical practice that it is today to the point where the UK uh, carries out 2.5 million transfusions every year around the world. Every three seconds, someone receives blood. And uh, Jean-Baptiste Denis, although he was disgraced, although Mrs. Morois was probably executed uh, for killing her husband, although she didn't, um, Jean-Baptiste Denis is my villain, but he's not really. My first hero is Dame Janet Maria Vaughan. But actually, I'm going to talk to you about another hero. Let's call him a sub-hero. Uh, Percy Lane Oliver. Percy Lane Oliver was a public servant. He worked for Camberwell Council. In 1921, he was 43 years old. He was married to Ethel Grace. And he was honorary secretary to the Camberwell Division of the British Red Cross. At this time, the early 1920s, there was by now a system of blood donation, um, but it was not organised. Uh, there was no blood storage, so to get blood uh, you had to physically bring the person to the recipient. They would then be connected by having the, the donor's um, veins cut, deeply cut, um, and the recipients. And they uh, it was very painful, it was very cumbersome, and it was difficult to find donors. Often doctors would have to go out into the street to find them, and um, they often called upon the police to donate and other public servants. Um, Although one eminent surgeon at the time thought this was a very bad idea because he said the policeman's lot is said not to be a happy one. 
and it would be putting a rather severe strain on his already superhuman benevolence to expect him to give his blood to all who need it. Um, and in Evanston, Illinois, firemen were asked to give blood because the local police chief complained that his men, who were being used frequently as blood donors, were looking anemic. The most common way to get blood, um, rather than grabbing a passing police officer, was to pay for it. So blood was generally sold, not donated, in the 1920s, and this was such a common practice that in the New York uh, City area, there was a New York Blood Sellers Union, and in the 1920s, hospitals were paying $100 a pint. That's an extraordinary amount. It, but this whole system was known as on the hoof because it was not organised, uh, you couldn't easily find donors, and a lot of people didn't think it was ideal. Percy Lane Oliver um, didn't realise he was going to be so heavily involved in blood donation, but according to a film that was produced by Ministry of Propaganda, uh, in, which, in which Percy Lane Oliver plays himself, it's about the history of blood donation, the story goes that in 1921, uh, Percy was in the offices of the Camberwell Red Cross with some volunteers and the phone rang. It was King's College Hospital looking for some blood. Um, Nurse Linstead, one of the volunteers, happened to be the right blood type they were looking for. So she went off to King's College Hospital and gave her blood and apparently what she called the pint, a pint of the best and apparently became the country's first voluntary blood donor. The actual story is much more complex than that, but this is a story of heroes and villains, so we'll accept that story. Anyway, it's certainly true that the uh, Camberwell Red Cross uh, section began a system of organised donation. They didn't, it didn't uh, immediately succeed. Um, the first year they only had four donors, but it grew and grew, and uh, by the next year they had 13. They kept their details on index cards so they could call upon them. By 1922, a woman whose husband was dying at Guy's Hospital was told about um, the Camberwell crew. She approached Mr Oliver for a donor, she got one, and her husband lived. And from that time on, Mrs Oliver recollected later, the word seemed to go around in hospital circles that there was a band of lunatics somewhere down Camberwell Way willing to give their blood to any necessitous patient in hospital. However, there was a logistical difficulty because even if you had these details on the index cards, hardly anyone had a telephone. So once again, the police were called upon and um, they, not always, they tried to contact donors by telegraph or taxi driver but often they would just send the police round, which was obviously not particularly um, popular with the neighbours. Uh, one donor accepting the kind offices of the police on such occasion had his family's embarrassment increased by being returned to his home in the early hours of the morning by a black Mariah, a police van. By 1937, there were thousands of volunteers and it was understood to be a successful system. Even so, the Second International Blood Transfusion Congress in Paris judged a voluntary blood donation system to be hopelessly utopian. But they hadn't met Janet Vaughan. So Dame Janet Maria Vaughan, um, I first met her as a name on a building at Somerville College, Oxford. And I was delighted because my third name is Vaughan and finally people would be able to spell it properly. I didn't pay much attention to her. I knew she'd been a principal, but beyond that, I wasn't particularly interested by Janet Vaughan until I learnt more about her. And Janet was born to a genteel family, but not to wealth. Um, they were well connected. Her cousin was Virginia Woolf. Her mother features in Room of One's Own. And... Um, Janet, though, was not considered bright enough to get a good education, unlike her brothers, so she was given what she called indifferent schooling. Um, but nonetheless, she aspired to go to Oxford and she took the entrance exam twice and failed. She was probably dyslexic. On the third time, she went up to Oxford with her mother. They had a bottle of claret the night before. <laughs> 
and um, Janak succeeded, was given a place at Somerville College and emerged several years later with a first class degree in medical sciences and became a doctor. One of the first things she did was work in the East End slums of London and that's what turned her into a socialist doctor. Um, and she never lost this socialism or this kind of ferocious passion. And she learned in the slums of London the connection between poverty and health, but also how powerful blood could be because she encountered many anemic women who simply couldn't afford good food and vitamins. And at that time, um, anemia was generally treated with arsenic. And Janet didn't think that was ideal. And she had read about a treatment using raw liver extract. So she uh, decided to uh, do her own experiments. She um, borrowed the minces of all her friends, including Virginia Woolf's, and she got a load of liver. She minced it and she gave some to some dogs. They survived. Uh, so she took it herself. And when she survived, the treatment was adopted and uh, that became the standard treatment for anemia um, and she didn't really get any credit for it. But she had other things to do, so she uh, carried on working um, in different hospitals. By 1938 uh, she was at Hammersmith Hospital and war was thought to be coming. People in 1938 were very scared. And Janet, by this time, had uh, been paying attention to the Spanish Civil War. And she had uh, discovered the work of a, a Catalan doctor called Dr. Federic Duran Jorda, who uh, was working in Barcelona during the Civil War and who had set up a very uh, unusual system of mass blood donation, storage and delivery. The storage was the unusual thing because although sodium citrate had been known to be how you safely store blood for 20 years or so, um, it there was still no um, disembodied blood system. You, It was still largely reliant on people turning up to the recipient. Durand Jorda, you couldn't do that in wartime. Uh, so Durand Jorda had a system of collecting blood putting it in glass bottles and then driving it around Barcelona to where it was needed in converted fish vans, um, usually singing English nursery rhymes along the way. So Janet had known this. She became friends with Duran Jorda and later hosted him when he fled. And uh, she looked around London in 1938 when tensions were so high that the government was already manufacturing cardboard coffins. And there was very, very high expectation that if hostilities did break out, then London would immediately be bombed and there would be up to 50,000 casualties in the first weekend. And Janet knew that casualties meant trauma and for trauma you needed blood. And she looked around London and she could only find eight pints of blood in storage uh, in a maternity hospital. So she set about doing something about this. She first approached the uh, man in charge of the emergency medical response who sent her away um, and she wanted, she approached him and asked him to um, be allowed to uh, develop a system that would work in wartime of mass blood collection and transport and uh, storage and transport. Um, but he sent her away calling her a naughty little girl she wasn't defeated. Uh, she uh, called together her peers and her friends and they sat around in her Bloomsbury living room um, putting together exactly this system in a very rigorous and complex um, set of uh, negotiations and discussions um, and they came up with all sorts of all sorts of um, standards and decided what equipment was needed uh, down to the tiniest syringe. Um, they decided upon modified milk bottles to transport the blood in and they would use converted walls ice cream vans. There would be a system of four blood depots around London. Uh, they would uh, assist in collecting the blood, which was being done by going into workplaces and factories, 
and they would also uh, store the blood and transport the blood in the walls ice cream vans. But it was a false alarm in 1938 and although Janet's system was ready to be up and running, in fact uh, negotiations were successful, though not for Czechoslovakia. And uh, in late 1938, uh, everyone said, Janet wrote, that the only blood shed at Munich was the blood that Janet shed at Hammersmith. On September the 1st, 1939, uh, Janet Vaughan received a telegram from the Medical Research Council that she described as laconic. It read, start bleeding. She had been given the directorship of the Northwestern Blood Depot in Slough. She had chosen the premises herself. She'd gone to meet Noel Mobbs, who ran the Slough Industrial Estate, and had have been given the use of the social centre, which also had a bar, which Janet thought was going to be very useful because... If you had volunteer drivers driving around London in a blitz, being bombed, um, the least you could give them at the end of their shift was a whiskey. So the ice cream vans were driven to Slough, the donors were called upon, blood was collected, and at 11.15, <clears throat> two days later on September the 3rd, the staff of the Northwestern Depot stood in the social centre bar in white coats and listened to the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain announce on the wireless that the country was now at war with Germany. And then, wrote Janet, we went back to our bleeding. She had a fleet of volunteer lady drivers um, to help her throughout the war. And I really wish a film had been made of this depot and I still think a film should be made. But um, because it sounds like fun, terrifying, but fun. And one of her drivers was uh, Lady Dunstan, who was a um, octogenarian who would arrive for her shifts wearing a posh hat and uh, a string of pearls, get behind the wheel of her ice cream van and set off through blacked out streets. So no headlights, no street lights, no lights anywhere, uh, potholes from war damage, uh, rubble terrifying but they would set out and transport blood to hospitals all over their uh, catchment area and they were extraordinary and um, Janet also went out with them in the vans uh, she wasn't just a bureaucrat she could never be just a bureaucrat and um, she uh, went out one night and found a very burned girl who had caught fire um, at home and uh, she was so burned that there was no vein accessible so Janet again this is Janet of the raw liver um, remembered that you could inject directly into bone which makes sense because of course bones produce most of our blood and she s stabbed this girl in her uh, sternum didn't think the girl would survive she Janet went away to treat other people um, and when she got back two hours later, she found the nurse who she'd left with the girl still giving the girl blood. The girl survived. 20 years later, applied to Somerville College, Oxford, where Janet Vaughan became principal um, and told Janet that she'd only applied to Somerville because of Janet Vaughan. Throughout the uh, war, the system of blood, this voluntary, non-remunerated system of blood collection and donation thrived and became more and more successful and in a way it was much easier in a war because you could easily appeal to people um, the propaganda was very powerful showing soldiers who needed blood uh, and the press played its role as well um, publishing colorful stories of people's blood who had saved far off soldiers including Mrs Backhouse of Beverly who assisted private cook of Meanwood Road Leeds who was almost eviscerated by a mortar bomb uh, but he was transfused with blood from Beverly and he lived. By the end of the war, blood, this system of blood supply had been, was considered such a success and doctors had got so used to using this very useful substance that uh, the blood service, National Blood Service, actually predates our National Health Service. That It was set up a year earlier and it was, uh, it still thrives today. Um, and I think we should be very proud of it. And I think if you can, if you can give blood, please do, particularly in 2021 when it's more difficult for um, blood stocks to remain high. And 
I think it's an enormous testament to Janet Vaughan um, that so many people these days, even though it's only 4% of the population who give blood, but so many people will give uh, a part of their body freely to a perfect stranger who they'll never meet for nothing more than a club biscuit and a cup of tea. And after the war, the Medical Research Council published a report about how the blood supply had been set up. And it said that the um, it had been in the minds of many medical men. But it wasn't. It was Janet. My next villain is an annelid worm with a mouth that holds several hundred teeth, a bite the same shape as a Mercedes-Benz symbol, and a saliva that contains compounds so useful and clever they have not yet been bettered by science. The leech was a very popular device to blood letters. And bloodletting has been recorded throughout history and literature. Um, ancient Indian scripts talk of uh, leeching and uh, blood drinking worms. Um, Babylonians wrote of a striped blood sucking worm that became thick with blood. And a war painting in the tomb of the Egyptian scribe Userhat thought to date to 3,000 years ago, pictures a figure applying leeches. But the real high times of leeching were in the 17th and 18th and early 19th centuries, when leeching was considered so useful that it was used for anything. And the person who really promoted uh, the leech as an essential tool of bloodletting was a Frenchman called Brousset, who decided during the Napoleonic Wars that everything, every ailment could be attributed to a disorder in the gut and the best way to address this disorder would be to apply a leech. And that became a mania to the extent that leeches were so well used in France that um, they were wiped out from their natural habitat. Before that, you'd find them in ponds all over Western Europe, and they were generally collected by sending poor young women into the ponds who collected the leeches by standing in there with bare legs uh, and waiting for the leeches to attach. Unsurprisingly, they fainted a lot. Um, they also used to send horses in, and horses could be bled so severely that they died. Um, but France wiped out its own natural leech population and uh, was forced in one year to import 41 million leeches. Leeching was so popular that you could rent a leech from your local pharmacy where they were kept in beautifully ornate leech jars. Um, but they were rarely prized in their own right. They were just seen as tools and very, very expendable. There were only a few people that I've come across who loved leeches on their own merits. Um, one was a politician, a Victorian politician in England called Erskine, who uh, thought he had been saved by two leeches, uh, so he named them Homer and Klein and he used to take them out to dinner with him. The other was Dr George Merriweather, who was a doctor in Whitby and an inventor, and one of the things he invented was the leech uh, barometer, or the Tempest Prognosticator that he thought would be very useful on a ship because he was convinced that leeches were sensitive to uh, pressure and moisture in the air and that they could predict storms. So in his Tempest Prognosticator, he had 12 cloches, glass um, jars really, in which leeches would live and they would rise up when they felt a storm coming. Sadly, the leech barometer never took off, although... Um, I am very fond of Dr. George Merriweather because of how respectful he was of his leeches. He called them noble companions. And um, because the mechanical barometer was taking off at the same time, so it was cheaper and you didn't have to feed the mechanics. But leeches have very rarely been prized and mostly they are scorned. Uh, you can find them in the thesaurus as a synonym for parasite. 
And I think that's unkind. And I also think that they are very poorly misunderstood. And one of the things that is misunderstood about them is that they are they are thought to be barbaric and medieval. Uh, they belong in Blackadder and they're definitely not modern. They're definitely not useful. They are just villainous little things that attach themselves to your legs on a holiday in the tropics somewhere. But in fact, leeches are still used in modern surgery and that's because science cannot replicate the anticoagulant compounds in leech saliva, which is extremely useful. If you have a torn off piece of your body, say the ear or the lip, that uh, when, if, if it gets reattached, um, requires reattaching lots of tiny capillaries, tiny blood vessels, it's very difficult and often it can be reattached, but then the blood will congeal. And in the 1950s, um, some Slovenian surgeons had uh, a case where they wanted to reattach a body part and they remembered the use of leeches. They, they used them. They were very successful. And 20 years later, uh, an even more famous case was uh, a surgeon in Boston who reattached the ear of a young boy, a three-year-old boy whose um, family dog had torn it off. And the surgeon, Upton, had uh, heard of leeches being used in the Vietnam War. So he uh, got hold of some, he applied them, he wrote a paper that has was given a very dull title but was actually sensational. And that was the rehabilitation of the leech in modern medicine. So for one of my trips for Nine Pints, I travelled down to South Wales, to near Carmarthen. Um, and I arrived at a nondescript building and found myself in the nation's only leech farm, Biofarm. And um, Biofarm is a thriving business. It exports leeches around the world because uh, leeches are commonly found in hospital pharmacies and they are frequently written about. It's not difficult to find a paper about leeching written by a surgeon. And uh, they are used to attach ears, or lips, or breast reconstruction, and there is nothing better. It's a, it's a last resort, but as a last resort, it generally works. However, there are downsides to leeching. Obviously, the disgust factor, but also leeches can shift. They're walking needles, essentially. And although... Um, they are used frequently. There are plenty of people who work with them, usually nurses, who don't write these papers because the papers are all written by surgeons. But the nurses are the ones who have to deal with the patients being leached um, and have to deal with the leeches. And they have very mixed feelings about leeches because they're the ones who, on a night shift, may have to go into a hospital room where a patient is being leached and then step on something that they weren't expecting to step on. Or they'll find leeches who, that have climbed the curtains or got into the bathroom or they can be anywhere. And so uh, I interviewed a wonderful Irish nurse who has written one of the very, very few papers of nurses' experience of leeching. And um, she tends to call them little slugs, though they're not slugs, they're worms. But um, even the nurses who can't stand them realise that they work and they are useful. But yes, if you, if you do use a leech, leech, you'd better tie it down because they move. And when they've been used in modern surgery, um, although they've been very carefully reared at Biofarm for two years, um, being fed every six months with um, sheep's blood, wrapped in a sausage casing and although they are highly prized and expensive um, sterile medical devices they are single use they are no longer um, reusable as they used to be in the times of leech jars in pharmacies and although they help us uh, and heal us what humans now do with leeches once they've been used once they've dropped off and fed, they are put in a jar of alcohol and exploded. And 
The natural lifespan of a leech is about 27 years. So I think that's pretty ungrateful. So I suppose my question at the end of telling you that the leech is a villain is, is it? Or is it the human that uses the leech that's villainous? My next hero is a man named Arunchalam Muruganantham, shortened, thankfully, to Muruga. But again, I'm going to swerve away from him first, and I'm going to talk about another villain, and the villain is menstrual blood. Throughout history, the menstruating woman has mostly been seen as negative. But it wasn't always this way. In very early literature, the menstruating woman was seen as powerful. And that made perfect sense because usually when someone emitted blood, it was because they were injured or dying. But here was a woman who could bleed and survive, and not only survive, but produce life. So in early literature, for example, in Pliny's Natural History, we find very extraordinary accounts of the power of the menstruating woman. For example, Pliny wrote, On the approach of a menstruating woman, nature would cringe and submit. Seeds which are touched by her become sterile. Grafts wither away. Garden plants are parched up and the fruit will fall from the tree beneath which she sits. Her look also is formidable because it will dim the brightness of mirrors, blunt the edge of steel, and take away the polish from ivory. The menstruating woman can also kill a swarm of bees, turn iron and brass rusty. She can scare away hailstorms and lightning, as long as she is both bleeding and naked. And at sea, she doesn't even need to bleed. A storm will flee before the sight of her unclothed body. And farmers should employ menstruating wives because if a woman strips herself naked while she is menstruating and walks around a field of wheat, the caterpillars, worms, beetles and other vermin will fall off the ears of, ears of corn. I wish this were true because it would be really useful on my allotment. But this idea of the menstruating woman as powerful eventually switched um, to the more negative view of menstruation and menstrual blood that uh, still persists today in our enlightened and industrialised world, in which uh, it was only two years ago that a television advert dared to show a red liquid in an advert for uh, a sanitary pad. Um, before that, it was that ridiculous blue uh, windscreen wiper fluid. The taboo around menstrual blood has lessened in recent years but it still persists and one of the problems is that women have internalized the idea that we should be ashamed of this blood that it's dirty um, and should be hidden and discreet and that's a message that has been drummed into us um, through advertising and education our entire lives and I have written and spoken out about menstrual blood um, for a very long time and I have been a consultant on menstrual blood. I have written many articles in The Guardian talking about how we need to bust the taboo and not be silent and and even so I found myself giving a talk at WaterAid about exactly this about menstrual taboo um, and suddenly looking down and realizing I had a lipstick in my pocket and worrying that it looked like a tampon. So this taboo is everywhere. The most extreme case of it that I've ever um, seen was in Western Nepal, where again I, I travelled with WaterAid and we met women and girls who were forced to live in unheated sheds when they are menstruating. And these, uh, these taboos and regulations are absolutely rigidly adhered to. Um, luckily, Chao Padi, which is the worst instance of menstrual taboo um, is, uh, is a minority practice in Nepal and in Western Nepal. But Nepal does have a three-day national holiday called Rishi Panchami, which is so that women can go and ritually cleanse themselves in case they have contravened any menstrual taboos, in case they have looked at a man or entered a temple or cooked or touched a pickle. Um, 
And this is, it's widely followed and it, I got up at four o'clock in the morning to go and look at it and it was heaving with these women who were rinsing themselves of sins they thought they had done. And that brings me to my hero, Maruga, who you may have heard of. He's, he's quite famous. Uh, he's known also as Menstrual Man. But Maruga was uh, born in South India, in Tamil Nadu, and he left school at 14 because his father died. He wasn't particularly well educated. Um, he became a machinist in a workshop. He had an arranged marriage to a woman called Shanti. They were very happy. And then one day Shanti came home and she was hiding something behind her back. And eventually Maruga... Uh, pressed her to show him what it was and it was what he calls her nasty cloths. It was her menstrual cloths so she was using strips of cloth to absorb her menstrual blood and she was hiding them because that's what millions of women do across the world. Um, they hide their menstrual cloths or rags and they wash and dry them in secret and sometimes not hygienically and uh, Maruga remembered then that his sisters had often hidden their menstrual rags in the thatch of their house to dry. And that's not hygienic at all. And they would get infections. And so here he was, he was shocked. And he said, but why don't you go and buy sanitary pads in the market? He'd seen them in the market. And Shanti said, because we can't afford sanitary pads. We need to buy milk and we can't afford both. So I buy milk. And Maruga thought this was a bad situation. And he was astonished that there was not affordable sanitary um, equipment for uh, poorer women in India. So he set about to do something about it. And he decided being uh, not a trained scientist, but having an inquiring mind and being a bit of an inventor, he decided to do his own field work. And he needed to know how to make a sanitary pad cheaply. So he needed to know what they were made of, the commercial sanitary pads. But he couldn't tell just from handling a sanitary pad. So he approached medical school students, girls, and asked them to uh, give him their used sanitary pads so he could examine them and figure out what they were made of and, um, and how, how they were absorbent. And amazingly, they did. And he was not run out of town yet. So he did his research, but he still couldn't understand it. He thought it was just cotton. So he uh, made up a simple cotton pad. He decided that the best way to experiment it um, would be to use it himself. He um, got a old leather football and he filled it with goat's blood. He set up a tube and a, a hand pump. Uh, he attached this to the sanitary pad. And at this point, I should tell you that he is a South Indian and in South India, men tend to wear white. And I hope that many women and girls will shudder at this point because uh, we never wear white on our periods, no matter what the advertising industry thinks. But Maruga went around on his bike uh, wearing white um, and every so often pumping this blood into his sanitary pad. And he says he got, you know, he got to learn how it was to be a woman, like looking around and checking your backside that you haven't stained. And, um, and but he still couldn't figure out what was in the sandwich pad. And eventually things became rough. Uh, Shanti left him because she thought he was playing around with the medical school girls. Um, his mother was furious because she thought he was doing witchcraft. When he was found washing at a well, washing the blood off himself, he was thought to be uh, involved in voodoo or, or to be a vampire. And eventually heard that the villagers were going to come and hang him upside down from a tree. So he left. And at some point, he finally understood what was in sanitary pads, which was cellulose, um, by getting a sample of cellulose from a firm in America and scratching it and realizing that that's how you got the fluffy compound that is the absorbent material in um, sanitary pads. So he developed over many years, he developed a machine that is entirely manual, pretty simple, 
and can be operated by poor women anywhere um, in India and around the world. And he became menstrual man. Um, and now he has uh, got about 4,000, more than 4,000 machines all over India and in various other countries that produce these very affordable sanitary pads. Um, and he has become a documentary called Manstraw Man, and he's also become a Bollywood film called Pad Man. And um, he's, he's wonderful. He's eccentric, he's funny, and he's done great good for women and girls. However, he is a slightly problematic hero. And I have to say this because I know that if he had been a woman doing the same thing, he would not have got the same attention. He would not have got prizes. He would not have become a Bollywood film. It's because he's a man who's done this. And so that's why it's problematic, because I know that there are many, many women who have been working for years to improve life for women and girls, particularly around what's called menstrual hygiene, who are campaigning to have toilets installed in schools because um, girls sometimes drop out of school when they reach their period and they have no toilet in their school. Um, and there are many, many women doing that around the world. And I'd like to see them become Bollywood films and documentaries, but I'm still waiting. I'm going to end with another hero, briefly. Um, but my hero is blood. I'm very fond of my blood. Even though I have uh, endometriosis, which is blood-related disease. But I'm still fond of my blood, even though it doesn't behave. Because it does so much for me, constantly. It's, it carries oxygen to my organs and tissues. It carries nutrients, heat and hormones, the signals that regulate my functions, my energy, my sleep, my mood. It carries out waste disposal. It rids my body of carbon dioxide and other unwanted matter. It clots when necessary. An amazing procedure, which I've become totally fascinated by. It fights infection and it repels foreign invaders. It's a tissue and an organ all at once, and it's probably my most important organ. And I know that my blood, my 30 trillion red blood cells, my 100 billion white blood cells, my platelets, my plasma, I know that my blood does all this, that it is my feeding station, my temperature control, my waste disposal, and my greatest defender, and it will never rest until I am dead. On behalf of our virtual audience tonight, I would like to warmly thank Rose George for a very personal exploration of the history, science and stories associated with blood. There can be few subjects in the world that have generated so many villains and heroes, and it's been a fascinating to hear the fruits of Rose's research on many of them. Next week, we'll hear from Stuart Eggington, Professor of Exercise Science at the University of Leeds, whose lecture is entitled Cold Blood. Thank you for joining us today and to do please come back online next Friday for another perspective on blood. Thank you.